We assume Russia's campaign targeted all 50 states. Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen delivered a blunt warning to the country's top election officials. No state is safe from cyber threats. So too did the country's intelligence director. Do you think states are doing enough to take the threat seriously? Yes, I do. Tom Hicks is chairman of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, which just handed out $380 million to states to strengthen their voting systems. But nearly 70% of the states waited more than two months to ask for the money. Now that the last state, Maine, requested it Friday, there's no requirement they spend it to protect November's midterm elections. How long do states have to use that money? They have five years to use that money, so... Um, Would you advise them to use it sooner? Exactly. And that's not the only missed opportunity. We've learned just 18 of the 50 states have asked the Department of Homeland Security for free risk and vulnerability assessments. DHS won't reveal which ones, citing security. And only about half of state elections officials eligible for permanent security clearances from the federal government have them. They need that clearance to receive ongoing classified information about threats. We asked Chairman Hicks about that, and we're stunned at his answer. Security clearances take time to get through. Right, so about 88 of the 150 so, eligible have So, them. for instance, my security clearance has not come through. I've requested it, but we're working to make sure that it's done correctly. So the chairman so, of the Election Assistance Commission does not yet have their security clearance? Correct. Isn't that a problem? Well, we're working on correcting that problem. That's a problem. Jim Condos is the Secretary of State of Vermont and the President of the National Association of Secretaries of State. Next up will be Charlie for the State of Mississippi. Which met this past weekend in Philadelphia. Condos showed us the scale and scope of the ongoing cyber attacks on his own systems. We're getting upwards of 2 million hits a day. Uh, approximately 800,000 of those we suspect are unauthorized attacks. 800,000? Correct. That's 40% of all web traffic every day to your state websites you believe could be malicious? We believe that that's so. That's a stunning number. It is. In, in fact, it shocked me. And that's just for Vermont. DHS told 21 states hackers probed or attacked their election systems in 2016. This year, a dozen states have at least one precinct that uses electronic voting machines that do not leave a paper copy of cast ballots, making it impossible to recreate a tally with paper if someone tampers with a machine leading House Democrats to label those states and six more as the most vulnerable in the nation. Still relying on paperless machines worries condos. You believe that the states that use voting equipment that do not keep a paper record of every cast ballot should change their election machines? Yes. Why? Because we think that going back to paper is necessary to protect the integrity of our elections. One estimate found replacing all paperless machines and fully securing elections would cost $1.4 billion. Updating 11-year-old guidelines at Chairman Hicks' Election Assistance Commission would cost far less. But the only federal agency focused full-time on elections has just two of its four commissioners, so it can't pass any new policy to protect the vote. The fact that there is no quorum I think is unacceptable. The White House just nominated a third commissioner, former Virginia Elections Chief Donald Palmer, but a hearing in Congress has not been scheduled. Also in Congress, a bill called the Secure Elections Act has bipartisan support, but has not yet been given a floor vote. And even with the threat of cyber intrusion still high, the White House eliminated its top cyber coordinator position in May. In Washington, Mark Albert, Hearst Television Investigates. The White House Thursday promised President Trump has ordered a vast effort to protect the elections. But that comes after months of local and state officials complaining about the lack of information, urgency, and money. Our democracy itself is in the crosshairs. The Secretary of Homeland Security, flanked by other national security leaders at the White House Thursday, said the country's elections are more resilient now than when Russia attacked the 2016 election. But they also acknowledged a pervasive, sophisticated campaign by Russia, and possibly others, is underway to steal information from candidates, spread division on social media, and corrupt our elections. This is a threat we need to take extremely seriously. But our National Investigative Unit last month found states and the feds are not taking it as seriously as they could be. Two-thirds of states had not had DHS cyber risk and vulnerability assessments. 
few states plan to spend all of their election security grants, $380 million in all, to protect the midterms. And half of eligible state elections officials did not yet have DHS security clearances to seek classified ongoing election threats. Even the chief federal elections official revealed to us he didn't have one. My security clearance has not come through. I've requested it, but we're working to make sure that it's done correctly. So the chairman of the Election Assistance Commission does not yet have their security clearance? Correct. This week, the Senate decided not to give states more money to protect the midterms following a similar move in the House. And despite the high-powered assurances of preparedness Thursday, the White House has eliminated its top cyber coordinator position. DHS held a national cybersecurity summit earlier this week to unveil new parts of its strategy. And Thursday, the director of national intelligence told reporters, quote, we're throwing everything at it. In Washington, I'm chief national investigative correspondent Mark Albert. In Las Vegas, land of luck and legend, a bunch of hackers rolled the dice to see if they could expose weaknesses in our elections. And they did. Some while playing a winning hand, a hand with yellow fingernails, cartoons, and stuffed animals. I am 11 years old. I'm 11 years old, 7 years old, 11 years old, and 7 and a half. These kids managed to manipulate replicas of election night results pages in key battleground states from 2016. We're moving to Iowa. Pages built, organizers say, using actual vulnerabilities previously reported. Is this pretty easy for you? Oh, yeah. To prove it, Jonathan Lenski from New Hampshire made it appear as if I won the election. Is this just for show? <laughs> no, so this is not make-believe. This is stuff that's actually happened. Jake Braun helped organize the Vote Hacking Village at this year's DEF CON, the world's largest convention of hackers. Ah, oh, there you go. Hundreds of whom scanned, screwed, and sabotaged nine different types of actual voting equipment. You're looking to hack it? Yeah, basically. Why? I want to help secure these things. Among the flaws hackers say they found, a voting scanner and tabulator still used in up to 24 states, according to the group Verified Voting, with no password or software verification to prevent it from being overridden. A touchscreen voting machine that hackers reprogrammed to play music and animated clips and an electronic poll book machine that signs in voters on election day, hacked in five seconds, potentially exposing unencoded personal information on voters. Many of the local election officials take this defensive posture and think, oh, well, we're criticizing them. Like, we're not criticizing them. We're saying, hey, look, the game has changed. It's not about them. It's about protecting our democracy. Even though 100 local election officials came to DEF CON, the National Association of Secretaries of State criticized the hacking as a pseudo environment that in no way replicates accurate protections. We reached out to two of the biggest manufacturers in the industry, Dominion and ESNS. In a statement, Dominion cautioned its best practices do need to be followed to ensure the integrity of the unit. ESNS told us physically accessing these machines in a polling place would be difficult, if not impossible. Having said that, we welcome the input from the voting village and constantly work to bolster security. Even if a voting machine is not hacked or ever connected to the Internet, there are ways to affect the results, researchers tell us. A very accurate replica. John Sebus of the Open Source Election Technology Institute in Silicon Valley set up for us a replica tally manager, software that adds up results from the precincts after the polls close. Go. We timed how long it would take to change the winner. It's loading the data. Using a single disk with malicious software brought back from a mock polling place where the machines were never connected to the internet. And here we are, we're done. So 22 seconds, and you've just changed who won that election. Yes. We think these are very important systems and deserve the very best, not only in security, but engineering and in design and experience of the people. They're that important. But so far, not all systems are the very best. Just this week, a group of researchers announced they found nearly one out of every three candidates for the U.S. House of Representatives has campaign websites with some sort of security error. What is your message to the American people? Work on your computer security, people. In Las Vegas, I'm Chief National Investigative Correspondent Mark Albert.
Behind this locked steel door somewhere in Northern Virginia, America's fight in cyberspace never shuts down. This is the place where we coordinate everything. Jeanette Manfra is the Department of Homeland Security's Assistant Secretary for Cybersecurity. She invited us onto the watch floor of the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, known as NCIC. So you could see election threats on this map. Absolutely. This team, operating 24 hours a day, detects, analyzes, and responds to cyber threats against the elections and the country. On election day, this map would show stark red if a severe cyber incident struck while Americans voted. Is the federal government doing enough to counter the threat to the elections? You know, I, I, always, I do always think we could do more. I think we are doing everything we can um, right now. Um, but it is, it's a long process. As we found in our ongoing investigation, that process has been slowed by turf battles, a lack of money, resources, and in some cases, urgency, and disagreements over strategy. The federal government's own record of security is pretty abysmal. That's Congress's top watchdog who told lawmakers the federal government has failed to implement 1,000 of its cybersecurity recommendations. You know that people are going to so, see that headline. I absolutely know that people will see that headline. We take GAO recommendations very seriously, and, um, and we're working diligently to close those that we agree with. Sometimes we disagree on what those recommendations are. Not usually, um, but sometimes we do. In research done exclusively for the National Investigative Unit, the GAO found Homeland Security actually disagrees often not implementing 44 percent of the watchdog's cybersecurity recommendations. But Manfred says progress to strengthen election security is being made. DHS has quadrupled the number of intrusion detection sensors on state election systems since 2016. Here's why DHS says that's important. Every day there are millions of attempts to penetrate U.S. networks. When those early warning systems installed on state election networks detect an attempted intrusion, Many of the alerts within 15 minutes go to a watch center for cyber threats in upstate New York. It then sends suspected breaches targeting elections to that NCIC site outside Washington. It's like calling the fire department. To help put out the cyber fire, analysts sound the alarm across the government, even deploying GO teams to state capitals to douse a cyber breach or catch the hackers in the act. In 2016, after the elections, DHS said about 21 states mm -hmm. uh, had some sort of detected malicious activity trying to get into their networks. How many states this election cycle have you seen? None. None? Not yet, no. But remember, in 2016, it was uh, later, it was closer towards the actual uh, election. Do you worry the next shoe is about to drop? I always worry the next shoe is about to drop, but um, everybody is much better positioned to, to be on the lookout for these sorts of things. Experts say the federal government would be even better positioned if it would fill the 15,000 IT positions currently vacant. In Washington, I'm Chief National Investigative Correspondent Mark Albert. Here on the first day of the summit, Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen told elections officials that while real progress has been made on securing the elections, quote, to be frank, a great deal of work remains. Our elections are just too important for a single point of failure. Nielsen is calling for every state to have a physical paper trail and effective audits by 2020. Some of the top election officials here are from states that don't have them. We need to update our systems. Secretary Nielsen also promised not to hoard cyber threat intelligence, even if a state election official does not have a security clearance. If we have intel, we will share it. You think they can do better? Yes, they can do better. Jay Ashcroft is the Missouri Secretary of State and the summit's host. In July, he said this about the need for a federal security clearance to see ongoing election threats. I'm sorry, I haven't been in government that long. That seems silly to me. You pick up the phone. It requires a change in tone. They are doing better than they have been doing. And part of what we want to do at this conference is to make sure people know that they can have trust in the system. And it's that voter confidence, not just cyber threats, that worries these election officials the most. In St. Louis, I'm Chief National Investigative Correspondent Mark Albert. Eric Hodge used to be an Air Force communications officer. Now he's delivering tough talk to election officials. There has been resistance, yeah. There's been As Director of Election Security Services at Cyber Scout, Hodge brought a message to St. Louis. This is a real high priority and something that 
um, I would would have hoped would have been addressed in some places maybe a little bit more aggressively than it has. What I'm worried about are attempts to manipulate voter confidence. Homeland Security's top-ranking cyber official Chris Krebs shared with election officials and us DHS's Election Day plan to spot threats. We're going to have what's called as a national situational awareness room. A virtual situation yep. room. Yep. If they see anything, they'll put it into the forum and everybody can say, you know what, I saw something like that too. But summit host Jay Ashcroft, Missouri's Secretary of State, thinks the real threat is not cyber. Vote fraud has been a greater problem than cybersecurity. Ashcroft cites a Missouri primary race decided by one vote, with two votes that should not have counted back in 2010. In 2018, his systems get 100,000 potentially malicious cyber scans a day. So far, vote fraud has changed elections, whereas cyber attacks have not. The biggest threat is definitely the attacks by our adversaries, not individual voter fraud. Not individual voter fraud. Hodge warns the weakest link may now be local election offices. In St. Louis, I'm Chief National Investigative Correspondent Mark Albert. <laughs> This is a really big team working on this problem. In fact, the team Nathaniel Gleischer works with as head of cybersecurity policy at Facebook just got a whole lot bigger. So we've doubled it. Doubled, doubled to 20,000 people in just the past year, all focused on election security, cyber threats, and content review. We have data science experts. We have threat intelligence experts. Gleischer showed us around Facebook's New York offices. The founder of the world's largest social media company, Mark Zuckerberg, just two days after the 2016 election, flatly dismissed the idea that fake news on his platform played a role in influencing the election. I think it's a, a pretty crazy idea, right? But this year, Zuckerberg told lawmakers he had changed his mind. We didn't do enough to prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. And that goes for fake news, foreign interference in elections. We were too slow, and it meant we, we missed things. And what we've been focused on is making sure that that doesn't happen. That's why this is such a high priority. That's why we're laser focused on this. In advance of this year's midterm elections, Facebook says it has taken down 1.3 billion fake accounts, built an election war room, and expanded partnerships with federal agencies, rolled out free security tools for candidates and campaigns, and launched an ad transparency database. I mean, we've talked about how we didn't have a broad enough perspective on the range of threats that we needed to be protecting against. Voters are dubious. A poll last month found 80% of Americans have no confidence, or not very much, that what they read on Facebook is true. Meanwhile, Twitter tells us it is also stepping up election security by removing hundreds of accounts pretending to be members of various state Republican parties, or which appeared to originate in Iran but it may fall far short. New research finds 89% of Twitter accounts that spread fake and conspiracy news in the 2016 election remained active earlier this year. Microsoft says it blocked an attempted breach against three congressional candidates and tells us it launched a defending democracy program that is now protecting more than 30 campaigns. I think there's no question, absolutely no question in my mind that everybody is taking this problem, this challenge seriously, including the social media companies. Facebook is also taking seriously its PR blitz, including this full page newspaper ad. This is a campaign to protect elections. This is a campaign to tackle this problem. But there is a limit to Facebook's transparency. No. <laughs> uh, is Facebook being as open and transparent as it should be on this topic? We've been pretty driven to be as open and transparent as we can be. In any security space, you always have to be careful that what you're doing isn't playing into the hands of the threat actor. So we have to be careful. In New York, I'm Chief National Investigative Correspondent Mark Albert.